An Introduction to the Science of Hadith by Ibn Salah Shahrazuri, 577-643, the most influential book on the science of hadith in existence. There is disagreement over the best method of striking out. We heard that Abu Muhammad ibn Khalad, the judge, said, The best striking out does not obliterate the word being struck out. Rather, writing a good clear line above the word indicates that it is invalid and the word can still be read under the line. We heard from Qadi Iyad something to the effect that the preferences of precise writers differ regarding striking out. Most of them favour extending a line over the portion of the text to be struck out, through the struck out words. That is also called splitting, shakka. Others do not draw the line through the portion of the text but rather fix it above it. However, they curve the ends of the line over the beginning of the end of the passage to be struck out. Some others regard that as a disfigurement and view it as marking up and defacing the page. Instead, they enclose the beginning of the passage to be struck out with a half a circle and do the same at the end. When the passage to be struck out is long, sometimes they do that at the beginning and the end of each line of the passage. However, sometimes it suffices entirely to enclose the beginning of the passage and its end. There are some teachers who regard both striking out and bracketing the passage with half circles as disfiguring. They are content with, with a small circle at the beginning and the end of the superfluous passage. They call the small circle a zero, sifr, as the arithmeticians do. Occasionally, scum scholars write no, la, at the beginning of the passage to be deleted until illa, until illa at the end. Something like this works well for what is established in one relation and omitted in another. God knows. The striking out of unintentionally repeated words, the judge Abu Muhammad ibn Khalad al-Aram Humurzi, God bless him, has anticipated us in this discussion. We heard that he said, some of our colleagues stated, of the two occurrences of the word, the one more deserving of being invalidated is the second, because the first was properly written and the second was written by mistake. So the mistake is more deserving of invalidation. Others said, the book is a symbol of what is to be read the occurrence of the word more clearly indicative of what is to be read, and the finer of them in terms of shape is more deserving of preservation. Finally, Qadi Iyad came and made an excellent distinction. He opined that if the repetition of the word is found at the beginning of the line, let the second occurrence be struck out to protect the beginning of the line from markings and defacement. If the repetition is found at the end of a line, the first occurrence should be struck out to protect the end of the line, keeping the beginnings and the ends of the lines free free from that is best. If one occurrence of the repeated word comes at the end of the line and the other at the beginning of the next line, let the one at the end of the line be struck out because it is more important to respect the beginning of a line. If the repetition occurs in the second or first term of a genitive construction or in the adjective or the word it modifies or something similar, we no longer take into account the beginning or the end of the line, but rather we respect the continuity between the two terms of the genitive construction and so forth in drawing the line. So we do not separate them out with striking out and we strike out the outer word of the repetition rather than the inner one. Erasing is like scraping in regard to the treatment and that was discussed above. There are various ways to do it. One of the strangest, although it is the safest, is what is related from Sahnoon ibn Sa'id at Tanuhi, the Maliki authority, to the effect that he sometimes wrote something and then licked it off. What we heard from Ibrahim al Nakhai, God be pleased with him, saying, ink on a man's clothes and lips is a sign of good character, also refers to this. God knows best. For works containing different transmissions of the same text, let the student undertake to record accurately the differences in his book and make a clear distinction between them, so that the transmissions do not become mixed up and confused and do not trip him up. The way they do this for him to put down first the text of the book according to one particular transmission. Then either in the margins or somewhere else, he attaches the additions from another relation, signals the omissions and records the differences. In each case, he should designate everyone who related it, giving his full name. If he uses a symbol or of one or more letters of the name, then he should, as said above, explain what the symbol means at the beginning or end of his book. In case he forgets with the passage of time or his book comes into the possession of someone else who will fall into confusion and error because of his symbols. When there are many different relations, one is sometimes compelled to limit oneself to symbols. For discriminating between different transmissions, some scholars felt it was enough to designate the supplementary relation with red ink. The Easterner Abu Dhar al-Harawi and the Westerner Abu al-Hassan al-Qabisi did that, as did many 
other teachers and recorders of hadith. When there is an addition in the supplementary relation of the book of the text, the student writes it in red. If there is an omission in the supplementary relation and the additional material is in relation to the recorded one in the main text of the book, he brackets that material in red. Whoever does this should make clear at the beginning or the end of the books to whom the relation marked with red belongs, as was stated above. God knows best. Stay tuned for many more parts.